Hello Steelers, and welcome to this building and painting video of the Plastic Soldier Company's 15mm Cromwell tanks. The reason I made this video is that my box didn't come with an instruction sheet, and I had to work out from photos online of where all the parts went, so I thought I'd help out others if they encounter the same issue. I'm also going to show you how I painted these, and the techniques that I use can be done by anybody, as I didn't use any special equipment apart from paints and paintbrushes that you can buy anywhere. I will put a list of all the things that I used in the description of the video below. Obviously there's also a thousand techniques when it comes to painting, but this is how I do it and this is what works for me. So without further ado, let's get on with it. The box comes with five sprues, each with a complete tank for the 15mm scale. You have the choice of either using the usual 75mm QF gun or a 95mm close support howitzer. You've also got the optional Cullen hedge cutter as well. The first thing I do is to remove all the plastic parts using a pair of clippers. Try to cut as close to the model but without damaging the plastic as you do this because it will make the clean up stage slightly easier. It is hard plastic but it does cut very easily. I then use a sharp scalpel to clean off the nubs of plastic left over from the sprue and I do this by running the side of the blade across the edge of the model where the excess plastic is. You could use a file to get this plastic off, and either way it's fine, but this is the way that works for me. Just be careful not to damage the model while doing this though. However, some dinks and knocks could occur as battle damage anyway, so I wouldn't worry too much about it even if you do. Once everything is cleaned up, it's time to begin the process of construction. I use liquid polystyrene cement for this, as it can be applied exactly where I need it, and any spills are not very noticeable anyway. I put the top and the bottom of the hull together using the liquid cement to seal the joints and then brushing it over them again once the pieces are set in place. Then the top plate of the hull goes into position ensuring that the radiator is pointing towards the rear of the vehicle. Then the back plate will slide into position just below with a nice snug fit. And finally for the rear of the hull, I attach this extra plate cover. I'm not sure which way around this goes and I couldn't actually find out from the photos online, but it seems to look fine either way at this scale. The glasses plate fits nice and snugly on the top of the hull. The space for it is perfectly sized and just requires a slight push from a thumb to get it in there. Then I put the bow machine gun in place using tweezers as the space is quite small to use your fingers. You could leave the hull here but I also added the extra details of the exhaust cover on the rear to disguise fumes and dampen the noise of the engine. And then finally I added the track covers. There are four of these, two on the front and two on the rear. The front ones are slightly rounded, while the rear ones are more sharp in shape. There is also only a slight ridge to join these to the hull, so be careful and dry fit them before gluing them in place. Then everything left on the sprue should be for the turret. This is made of a top plate, a bottom plate and four side plates. There are small ridges on the interior of the top and the bottom plate to indicate where the outer part should go. So use these as a guide to where you put your glue and then carefully attach the side plates, making sure to remember that the rear plate slides in between the two plates. I then added the commander and gunner's hatches. I left mine buttoned up, but there is an option to have them open with a commander figure. The places for both of these should be obvious, but make sure you get the commander hatches at the right angle. They open forwards and backwards rather than to the side. Assembling the gun is simple, as there is an obvious place inside the front plate for the gun to go. But ensure that you have it correctly positioned. The front plate has two rivets on one side and three on the other. The main gun should be next to the three rivets and the coaxial machine gun should be next to the two rivets. The front plate then sits over the top of the side armour and make sure you have the machine gun to the left hand side of the turret. And then it's just a case of sealing the top and the bottom of the turret together. I like to add stowage to my armour models, particularly the allied armour. There's a few reasons for this. One, it's historically accurate as there are plenty of photos of tanks covered in stowage. It was a place for crews to store their kit and things that they picked up on campaign. It also broke up the silhouette of the tank, so it was useful for avoiding being detected in battle. 
I bought some resin stowage off eBay from a company called Redog, and it came as a single cast piece, meaning I had to cut off the individual stowage pieces just to use them. However, this was simply done with a sharp knife, and then I cleaned it up with a small scalpel. Once I had decided which bits I wanted to use, I fixed them in place using super glue gel. The gel takes a little while to cure, so you have time to move things about if you really need to. Then we move on to the painting stage, but before we do, I like to attach my tanks to the top of all paint bottles. I do this with a spot of super glue on the bottle top and balance the tank on that to the point of equilibrium. Don't worry, the tank will snap right off again when we're done, you'll see. Let the super glue dry and we can continue. If you want to prime the models at this point, go ahead. I didn't bother because you could easily use the base coat as a primer anyway and give it a second coat after the first one has dried if you really wanted to. I see all kinds of information about priming and to be honest I do it sometimes and sometimes I just don't bother. I've never really seen a difference either way. So using a largish brush I will liberally apply Vallejo's Brown Violet. This has recently been renamed US Olive Drab and either will work. It's a good match for the Allied tanks in my opinion. You may have one that you prefer, if so use that, but this one works for me. I make sure to cover the entire model, and you could use an airbrush, but here I'm trying to demonstrate an easier way of painting. Don't forget the turret, which I've also blue tacked to a small piece of plastic while I paint it. When the model is completely dry, break out the null oil and liberally apply this to the tank. Get into all the nooks and crannies and make sure all the green is covered. If you find it pooling anywhere, just clean your brush and draw out the worst parts with the bristles. When the null oil has dried overnight, I began adding the decals. These are from Battlefront, but you can buy many different types depending on the theatre, date and the vehicle types. I wanted these tanks to be from the Desert Rats division as they use Cromwells a lot in Normandy, so I cut out the correct decals I needed along with the bridge weight badges. Soak the decals in water and they should eventually slide off onto the model using a brush or tweezers to get them into the correct position. I do this before dry brushing as the dry brushing will dull the decals down a little and make it look like they are slightly chipped as well. Also I use Microsol to soften the decals and make sure they confirm to the surface of the model better. Then allow the decals and the Microsol to dry completely. Overnight is a good rule of thumb and we can start their dry brushing. Dry brushing is an old technique that works perfectly well on armour due to the sharp edges. You put some paint on your brush and wipe off as much as possible allowing you to run the bristles over the model. This leaves paint on the edges only. For this I use Vallejo's Russian Uniform World War II. It's a nice accompaniment to the brown violet and the null oil base colour. Then using a small brush I begin painting the stowage in their base colours. I'll just use a variety of khakis, greens and browns of this to add colour to an otherwise monotone vehicle. Just be as careful as you can when you're painting this, but don't worry you can always go back with the brown violet and cut in any areas that you've overpainted. The next stage of washing the stowage will also disguise any difference of colours on the tank anyway. Whilst the stowage dries, I then turn my attention to the tracks, and I paint them with a medium sized brush in black. Be as careful as you can around the wheels and the other parts of the tanks. But don't worry because we can cover any of these mistakes with weathering later anyway. Just make sure all the track areas that can be seen are covered at this point. When the paint on the stowage is dry, I wash the stowage in Agrax Earthshade. This is similar to Null Oil but is browner so it looks better with cloth and similar. It is a really good wash and you can use it here to go over the repainted areas of brown violet to blend them in a little bit. And in turn, when the Agrax has dried, I use the base colours of the stowage to paint in the highlights. This is things like the folds in the cloth, the straps, and anything else that stands out. You can do more highlighting here if you want to, but I find a basic one with the base colours is enough over the top of the Agrax. Then I turn back to the tracks, using Vallejo's oily steel. I paint the raised area of the track, almost in a dry brushing style, but with much more paint on the brush. This will easily pick out the metal parts of the track, but they leave the black in the recesses. And then when the tracks are completely dry, I use a rust wash by Flory Washers to go over the tracks once again. This is a clay wash that settles nicely into the recesses and falls away from the raised areas. But here you can even use a thin down rust paint to get the same effect. The Flory wash goes on very bright, but it will dry with a very nice dull rusty look. When the rust wash is dry, I weather the tanks with more dry brushing. 
This time I used khaki and a large brush to create a tide mark of dust and rainwater around the bottom of the hull and the tracks. This will help really bring all the various colours together and make the tank look like it's lived in. As with everything you can do as much or as little weathering as you want but I just like the look of the tanks in action like this. Then the final action is to apply varnish. This is Windsor & Newton's Professional Artist Spray Matte Varnish. It is the best on the market as far as I'm concerned and it's never let me down. Just give the model a good spray. Remember to leave a window open or use a mask or even do it outside. I know this might upset some people but I like to base my vehicles, especially in 50mm scale. And for this I use plastic card cut to the correct size for the tank. In this case it's 2.5 inches by 1.25 inches. This is then painted in Vallejo's flat earth, and then when that's dry I just use PVA glue to stick static grass to the base. As you can see, the tank snaps straight off the paint pot that I glued it to to the start, and when the static grass is dry, I then use super glue gel to attach the tank to the base and we're done. As I said, you may have better ways of doing these stages that work for you, but this is the way that I am able to paint tanks pretty quickly for the tabletop. I'll put a list of the paints and the products used in the description below as I said, and if you've enjoyed the video please do subscribe and hit that like button. You can also leave a comment below and support the channel through my Patreon, the Ko-fi or even channel membership. You'll find links for all of these in the description below. Thank you very much for watching.